I'm, I'm not a Julia person. Paul is the year guy if you have Julia EHT questions, and he'll be talking about it in the second half of, of the session. Um, but I wanted to just kind of give a broad overview about why we're interested in uh, Julia and tell you a little bit about the story of the EHT and where Julia actually fits in, in that aspect. Um, so first, why are we interested in studying black holes? This is what we do as part of the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, well, the kinds of black holes we're interested in are really supermassive black holes. They reside at the centers of most galaxies, including our own. And uh, these black holes, they power these huge jets of plasma that you can see here on these beautiful photos. And these jets are, uh, this process of launching these jets is the most energetic process in our entire universe. And we don't quite understand how these happen. And these jets have a fundamental uh, role in where we come from because they uh, play a vital part in how um, galaxies form, how uh, stars form, uh, and this whole feedback loop of radiation into the host galaxies and nearby galaxies uh, are a major part of the evolution of the universe. So understanding black hole fundamentally helps us answer the one of the most fundamental questions of humanity, where do we come from? Um, so there are about three open questions in the, in the field of black hole research right now, these broad ranging ones. So what do black holes teach us about space time and fundamental physics? Black holes are the simplest signatures of uh, gravity and space time. So they can teach us a whole lot about theories of gravity, how do black holes feed and launch these jets that I talked about, and how do black holes form, evolve, and affect their environments. Now, EHT is not so much of a galaxy evolution instrument. We really try to peer down to see black holes as they are. And so we're mostly interested in the first two questions. So there are two black holes. Uh, the two biggest black holes on the sky are these two, uh, the M87 black hole and Sagittarius A star. M87 lives at the center of the M87 galaxy. It's 55 million light years away from us. That's really far. Um, but it's also six and a half billion solar masses, which means it's a huge black hole. It's actually one of the most massive black holes in our local universe. And uh, because of its mass, uh, its size on the sky, which is proportional to the black hole mass, is actually about 40 micro arc seconds, which is about the size of a donut on the surface of the moon seen from Earth. That's pretty small. Sagittarius A star, on the other hand, is much smaller as a black hole. It's only 4 million solar masses, but it's 27,000 light years away from us. It's in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. Now, Sagittarius A star is about 50 micro arc seconds on the sky, so a little bit of a bigger donut, like a Boston cream, on, a, uh, on the surface of the moon. So uh, we have these two black holes, and they're about the same size on the sky, but 40. 15 micro arc seconds is really, really tiny. So how do we get a telescope that can make an image of it? Well, it turns out if you make the calculation and you observe at a wavelength of about 1.3 millimeters in the radio band, uh, where you can peer through all the gas between us and the centers of these galaxies, um, the size of the telescope you need, the diameter, is about 13 million meters. Now that's a big telescope, and it turns out funding agencies uh, couldn't really pay for it. So we decided, okay, let's find another kind of hack uh, in order to make a telescope this size without actually building one this size, like a Death Star telescope kind of thing. Um, so what we did is use this technique, which won the Nobel Prize in 1974, called Very Long Baseline Interferometry. Essentially, we connect telescopes uh, by simultaneously observing the source and computationally design a telescope, a virtual telescope the size of the Earth through the connections between these telescopes. Now, these telescopes are not physically connected. These are just kind of invisible lines around the world, uh, but they're connected via our instrumentation. So a brief recap of how very long baseline interferometry works. Now, um, if you're uh, into radio imaging, the most of the imaging techniques and data you've probably dealt with is uh, connected element interferometers. So things like the VLA or ALMA or these bigger uh, arrays that are coming like LOFAR, like DSA 2000, like the SKA. Um, but we're dealing with a very different regime with the EHT because our telescopes are not connected and there's really very few of them. So very long baseline interferometry uses a pretty simple concept, but I'll explain a little bit of the challenges. So we need to observe the signal from the source from the black hole at the exact same time at each telescope in order to combine the signals from all the telescopes and make an image. And so uh, the source uh, emits waves, and because it's far away, the waves arrive as plane waves on Earth. Because our telescopes are pretty far apart, it turns out that there's a time delay that we have to take into account. So you'll see if you follow one of these uh, lines that one of the waves will arrive at the lower telescope earlier than at the other telescope. If you don't take into account this distance, 
uh, this time difference, you destroy your signal. And so how do we take into account this, uh, this uh, issue? We actually use uh, very precise atomic clocks at our telescopes, which are uh, these hydrogen maser powered clocks. They're so precise that they lose about a second every million years. And so these clocks time tag our signal and we digitize it and we record it onto standard helium filled drives. And so essentially we freeze the light that arrives at each telescope uh, into these hard drives and then we combine them at a later time where we can make all these alignments. Um, yeah, okay, so building uh, the EHT uh, was a pretty long process, and it was uh, started in the early 2000s with these three telescopes here. Um, then over the, okay, this is, I need to, <laughs> Paul, I'm sorry, your Netflix uh, suggestions need to be removed. <laughs> um, all right, so it was started in 2007, and then over the years, we've added more and more telescopes, and we've also lost some that got decommissioned over time. Then we arrived to 2017, where we had six different locations, six single-dish telescopes, and two phased arrays, uh, these two here. Now, you'll notice that all these telescopes look completely different from each other. This is because we did not build them as part of the EHT. We tried to borrow them and make collaborations between these facilities that were built for completely different science in order to join our endeavor to make an image of a black hole. Why these telescopes? Well, they just happen to be uh, able to observe at 1.3 millimeter wavelengths, which is not an easy feat for radio observing. They are at very high and dry places because water vapor and uh, instability in the atmosphere completely destroys our signal at this uh, observing wavelength. And so these telescopes uh, came together, we installed these, these clocks uh, and these receiver systems, and we carried out our observations. So then how do we get from recording to image? So we record our signal onto our, our hard drives, we ship them to what we call a uh, correlator, which is a, um, a special purpose multi uh, supercomputer uh, at two different locations that combines the signals. So what it does is that it plays back these uh, um, frozen light from the telescopes and it realigns them, it fixes this delay, time delays, uh, due to the Earth's curvature, different uh, properties of the Earth's model, location of the telescopes, and atmosphere. So it corrects for all that. And then uh, it extracts the signal from the black hole that is seen, that is correlated between the pairs of telescopes. Then we move to the calibration stage where we uh, do finer corrections of the atmospheric effects in the data, more instrumental effects, so that we can average down the data over time and build up our signal to noise. Then the final data, which is uh, uh, deemed an analysis quality, then moves on to our imaging techniques that try to look for a sky image that fits the data uh, very well. But we have a problem because what we deal with with VLBI is what we call an ill post uh, imaging problem. We have an infinite amount of images that could potentially fit the data. The reason for that is because we are sampling a very sparse uh, uh, part of our Fourier space. So we observe, what we measure at the telescopes is complex visibilities. We have a phase and an amplitude, and we look at everything in the Fourier domain and then transfer it to an image domain to make an image. So uh, we use this technique called aperture synthesis where the Earth's rotation helps us fill our coverage. That is why we have more points here than we really should have if we just take a snapshot with just our few telescopes. And then we combine the data on temporal and spatial scales as we sample over our Fourier space as the Earth rotates and the lengths between, uh, the relative lengths between our telescopes actually changes in projection to the source. So that's how we stack all the data and then we make an image. But making an image was actually a pretty difficult process because um, we were obviously biased about what we could imagine a black hole to look like because of our simulations, theory, et cetera. So we uh, tried to find a way to, um, to uh, get rid of some human biases by doing this blind imaging stage. So we split our imaging group into independent teams, uh, four of them for M87, five for Sagittarius A star, and then each team had to image independently using whatever software they wanted and whatever user-based choices they wanted within that software. Then after blind comparisons of the results, we opened up the data and then we moved on uh, to the second stage after we agreed across teams. And the second stage was a very extensive parameter survey with our uh, imaging pipelines. And this parameter survey involved the creation of synthetic models that would mimic our data but have different, uh, different ground truth images. 
Um, and so we did a kind of uh, simulation-based inference or kind of very primitive machine learning type uh, testing on our, synthetic, uh, on our synthetic data. And we got tested thousands and thousands of parameters uh, of our imaging softwares and then ranked them by how well they, they were able to reconstruct all our synthetic models. And then the top ranking ones were used for the black hole data, the real EHT data. Um, then we move to a, a third step, which is image validation, which is how well they fit to the data, how consistent they are to the other sources we observe in the same uh, observing campaign, and how robust the structure is that we're seeing to individual choices. Like if we kick out a station in the array, what happens to the image? Can we trust this, uh, this structure? So this really worked great for M87. Um, and for M87, uh, in the imaging, we used three uh, imaging software packages. One was an inverse modeling technique, which is clean, uh, which I'm sure you've heard of if you do radio imaging. It is the traditional radio imaging method. And then we had two regularized maximum likelihood methods, uh, which is our forward modeling techniques, uh, which were designed specifically for the EHT and for solving this um, sparse sampling problem. Um, so we tested thousands of parameters, and then we ranked them, and then the top ranking ones for each of these three softwares were averaged together to make one image per observing day of the EHT. Here are the four images. We also have a big modeling suite that modeled uh, the ring uh, for M87 and measured the mass of the black hole to be six and a half billion solar masses. Uh, we also did the sim, a sim thing for polarization, where we used five individual softwares, uh, the three imaging ones, and two more posterior exploration MCMC softwares uh, to look at polarization, and we reconstructed the spiral structure here. The spiral polarization structure tells us about magnetic fields near the black hole. And magnetic fields, uh, these magnetic fields tell us that the magnetic fields in M87 are pretty ordered, and they're pretty moderate, which means they're able to launch this jet that we see in M87. Now, these two black holes, as I mentioned, they're pretty different in size. And so just to give a kind of sense of scale between the difference, here's M87. The entire shadow engulfs our solar system, including where Voyager 1 currently is. Uh, Sagittarius A star, in comparison, could fit in the entire orbit of Mercury. Now, for M87, because it is so large and light has a finite speed, it takes a few days for light to go around the black hole. This means that in our aperture synthesis method, where we stack data over time, our image is virtually static on the sky. And so we can do this aperture synthesis and make a static image. For a Sagittarius A star, because of the size difference, it takes light only a few minutes to go around. And so every few minutes, your image is structurally changing, which means aperture synthesis actually breaks down. If you try to make an average image over eight hours, you have to deal with what we um, you know, nicely call at least motion blur. The variability of the source is pretty extreme and it makes making an average image very challenging. For Sagittarius A star, we use four independent methods, the same ones for M87 plus an additional Bayesian imaging method called Themis. Now the problem for Sagittarius A star is that we did this whole parameter survey where as M87 ranking the parameters were pretty easy and we had top ranks. For Sagittarius A star, there were thousands of parameter combinations that fit the data the same. And so we were in a little bit of a pickle. How do we make one image from this? So what we did is use a clustering algorithm. So I want to show you a little bit what it does. So here's a movie of the Dolomites. One's a pretty uh, variable movie, one's a pretty static movie. We take our camera and we make different long exposure images of these two movies with different camera settings. And now we're going to cluster them into four independent clusters. This is what we did for Sagi Star. So if we do this with these uh, clusters, the very variable one has three clusters where you see the dolomites and one cluster where you don't see it because of all the clouds that pass through. I'll let it replay one more time. So um, then when you do this, you'll notice that the three ones that do show the dolomites, uh, they have a pretty different kind of cloud coverage. And then the one where you don't show it is really where the clouds are all covering it. So here are all your um, long exposure images, and then the ones for the pretty static movie, and then you make the clusters, one, two, and three, where you see the dolomites with different clouds, and then one where you don't see the dolomites. And then the, for the pretty static ones, they look virtually the same. Now this is what we did for M87 and Sag A star. So for Sag A star, we had all thousands of images that fit really well, and we clustered them into four clusters. And then we ended up with um, different uh, four clusters for Sag A star, one, two, three rings with different um, 
uh, structure uh, along the ring and then one non-ring cluster. The non-ring cluster for Zagiostar is only about 2% of the entire set, so we're pretty confident that it is a ring, but we're not as confident as for M87 about the brightness distribution on it. Um, so this is where the story ends for EHT, for what we have published so far for these two sources, but we've observed a lot more since then. We have observing campaigns where we've added more telescopes. But right now, the EHT has only 11 telescopes, so we haven't solved our major problem of really understanding the coverage. So where we're going next is really what I want to show you a little bit of, and then Paul will talk about more. Um, what's next for us is what we call the next generation EHT. So this is what the EHT looks like right now in 2023. What our plan is, is to really increase our coverage. So right now we're using every telescope out there that's available for us to use at one millimeter. What we want to do is build new telescopes and put them at uh, uh, perfectly chosen sites such that our coverage is enhanced when we make images. So we have a two-phased approach where we have five new stations by phase one and then up to 10 new stations by phase two. Now, if you have this nice simulation of M87 here with its jet, in 2017, we don't see the jet because we have all these gaps in our coverage. And in, with the NGHT, we really expect to make these kinds of images on a regular basis, and we want to do monthly monitoring of the source to make a movie. Uh, and then uh, you'll see this connection between the ring and the jet. Now, making monthly images, monthly observations is a whole lot of data, and we can't just carry out making these enormous parameter surveys across softwares every time we want to make an image. And so we had to think about how to systematically uh, change the way we build software in order to make proper systematic analysis of the image space. And so um, one of the major aspects of that has been our move to Julia, and Paul will talk about it with his amazing code comrade uh, and what that has been able to do for uh, EHT and for NGHT type observations. Now, I just want to end. I don't know if the audio is going to work, though. We haven't tested it, but we have like April oh, 2019. The Event Horizon Telescope saw the supermassive black hole that launches a jet from the center of galaxy M87. Months later, a sharper image, as if through polarized glasses. Now, May 2022 the hard-to-see black hole at the heart of our own galaxy. What's next? The next generation EHT will allow us to answer a new set of deep questions. How does a black hole power jets like M87s? Can we make a movie of the actual jet launch? And can we sharpen our focus to see fine details of light as it orbits a black hole? To meet these ambitious goals, we are dramatically expanding our Earth-sized telescope. The NGEHT will transform our view of black holes by increasing bandwidth, adding observing frequencies, and establishing new dish sites around the world. By adding dishes to the global array, the NGEHT will allow us to observe the link between M87 spinning black hole and the near light speed outflow as never before. And by observing each week, the NGEHT can make the world's first movie of a black hole. With the NGEHT, we could begin to see the first of the infinite rings orbiting around black holes, allowing us to measure how much black holes are spinning, test Einstein's general theory of relativity, and reveal the nature of space-time itself. Yeah, this is where I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, let's get started with questions. We have time for a few, and I'll also ask the next speaker to come up. So um, the, the uh, pictures you see at the top here, um, they are actually not snapshots of a time series. They are average images of like eight hours of looking at the source, but with different parameters of our software. Um, they just happen to all pass through this criteria of these synthetic data tests. And so we can't tell apart which of these ones is better than the other. They all fit the same because the time variability of the source is really what creates all this kind of movement in, in differences between each of these images. But these are all like these motion blur, long exposure images. Each one is a long exposure image. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll, I think I have to ask this. Don't they already kind of have what we're looking for? 
I have a movie of Sergei Star. Uh, we don't. No. We do not. No. <laughs> we do not. <laughs> They, they have not published anything. I have not seen a movie from them. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have done tests of dynamical imaging or movie making with our data. I see. Well, we um, in our papers, we have done tests in which we try to reconstruct a movie, but we've deemed that uh, the coverage is way too sparse to uh, be able to disentangle any motion from just effects of the gaps that we have in our coverage. And so right now, really going to NGHT, adding up to 10 more stations is really where it's going to make a difference in how the snapshots look like for Saji Star and really will make the jump into being confident about movie structure and actual motion in time. Could you not use like the orbit of Earth or satellites or things like that to continue to grow coverage outside of? I mean, maybe that's more expensive. I'm just curious. Oh yeah, we can certainly. So um, there's a there's currently I think one space mission that has been successful in doing this for VLBI, which is called Radio Astron, which uses one satellite uh, dish up in space with a ground array. But that one only goes up to 20, uh, 20, uh, 1.3 centimeters wave. Um, so for millimeter uh, timing of the uh, satellite and the position and also downlink of these massive amounts of data are the challenges that we're facing forward. But we are actively thinking about space missions to increase our, our diameter, to increase our resolution. And in that way, actually going up to space, we can uh, make images of up to 10 more black hole shadows uh, that are out there just within the limit of reach uh, with an actual satellite that would increase our resolution.